Okay, the Heidelberg Catechism at the Synod of Dort. From the very beginning, the Heidelberg Catechism was in use among Dutch-speaking Reformed churches. And in 1563, the year the Catechism was composed at Heidelberg in the Palatinate, not one, but two Dutch translations of the Catechism were prepared for Dutch congregations in exile. One in Emden, Germany, the other by Petrus Stathenus for his Dutch exile congregation at Frankenthal near Heidelberg. In the Netherlands itself, the first evidence of teaching the Catechism appeared in Amsterdam in 1566, before Reformed churches were formally established in the northern provinces. That same year, the earliest Dutch edition to be published in the Netherlands appeared at Delft. The popularity of the Catechism in the emerging Dutch Reformed churches is clear in the fact that no fewer than 61 Dutch editions appeared by 1585. That's in about 20 years. As early as 1566, three years after the Catechism was written, the practice of regular Catechism preaching was instituted by Dathanus in his Dutch refugee con uh, congregation at Frankenthal. This practice rapidly spread into the Low Countries. Gradually, synods sought to legislate the practice of regular catechism, Sunday afternoon catechism services in all Dutch Reformed churches. Finally, afternoon catechism services that followed the Heidelberg Catechism became fixed in the church order of the National Synod of The Hague of 1586. In 1568, for the first time in the Dutch Reformed churches, the catechism was recognized as having confessional authority at the convent of Wesel. Yet for the next two decades, the Dutch Reformed churches requir required subscription only to the Belgic confession and not to the Heidelberg catechism. But once the the custom was established of using the Heidelberg Catechism in catechism services in most Dutch service, uh, churches. It was but a small step to require that ministers subscribe to the catechism along with the Belgian Confession. This happened first in 1593 in North Holland and South Holland. In 1608, the earliest form of subscription required adherence to the doctrine contained in both the Catechism and the Confession. Now, given the importance of the Heidelberg Catechism in the Dutch Reformed churches, it's no surprise that the Catechism came up for discussion at the National Synod of Dort in 1618-19, even though the Synod was convened, first of all, to deal with the Armenian question. Now in this presentation, I'll discuss six ways that the Catechism came up on the agenda at Dort. In the regulation of afternoon Catechism services, in discussion of Catechism instruction, in the Remonstrant or Arminian observations on the Catechism, in the Palatine delegates' response to the remonstrant observations, in the examination and formal approval of the Catechism, and in the composition of forms of subscription. First then, Catechism services. Here the first thing, interesting thing to recognize, is that in the Dutch Reformed churches before the Synod of Dort, there were no separate catechism classes. We've probably all been schooled on catechism classes. They didn't even have them. Apart from some short-term instruction for those preparing to take part in the Lord's Supper, the only regular 
catechism instruction done in the churches occurred in Sunday afternoon catechism services. Now, in its pro acta sessions in late November 1618, before the arrival of the remonstrance at the Synod, the Synod took up the issue of catechism services. The discussion that followed revealed that the sad state of catechism preaching, especially in country villages, for a number of reasons, due to negligence of pastors, pastors who served two churches, a lack of Sunday observance. After many delegates offered suggestions for remedies, the synod came to a decision on catechism preaching. The decision first affirmed the Article 61 of the last National Synod of The Hague of 1586. Quote, that the pastors in all places shall ordinarily in afternoon services briefly explain the summary of the doctrine contained in the catechism in order that it may be completed in this way every year. Now it also charged all pastors under pain of ecclesiastical censure to always preach sermons on the catechism on Sunday afternoons. These afternoon services must not be neglected due to low attendance. Even if the pastor should preach to no one except his own family. Government authorities need to be asked to enact strict legislation to prohibit all everyday labor, especially games, drinking parties, and other violations of the Sabbath. Combinations where pastors serve two churches should be done away with. Otherwise, the pastor should hold catechism services in each church on alternating Sundays. Church visitors should ensure that pastors are faithful in this responsibility. And if any who profess the Reformed religion refuse to attend afternoon services, they're worthy of ecclesiastical censure. Now, in the post acta sessions, when the synod revised the church order, no change was made to the article on catechism preaching. Article 61 of the previous church order of The Hague was simply reaffirmed. Moving on to catechetical instruction. After treating the issue of catechism services, the Synod of Dort moved on to discuss the manner of catechizing in three sessions. The content of the catechism was to be discussed later. Here it was only the manner. Since the churches complained, and it was evidence from by experience, that catechism services did not sufficiently instruct youth in the first fundamentals of the faith at their mental level, the synod was asked to give serious thought to the most suitable means besides catechism services to instruct youth and adults in the Christian religion. The next morning, President Bogerman gave a speech on the necessity and usefulness of catechizing. Then both the foreign and the Dutch delegations presented their advice on the best means to catechize. We don't have time here to summarize each of the 21 documents that were presented to the Synod, but the main themes appear in the Synod's decision on catechizing. So in session 17, President Bogerman read to the Synod the draft of a synodical decision on catechizing that he and the other officers had drawn up based on the advice from the, all the delegations. This decision provided policies for both youth and adults. For youth, there was to be threefold manner of catechizing. In the home by parents, in the school by teachers, and in the church by ministers, elders, sick visitors, and sermon readers. 
Christian magistrates were to promote this work to ensure that each faithfully did their duty. So first to the duty of parents. It is to instruct their children in the basics of Christianity at their level, to urge them to godliness, to engage them in family prayers, to take them to church services. They should review catechism sermons with their children, read and explain scripture passages, and assign some passages to be memorized. If parents are negligent in this task, they are to be admonished by the minister and, if necessary, censured by the consistory. Secondly, schools, where youth may be instructed in the fundamentals of Christian doctrine, they are to be established everywhere, and the state should provide adequate salaries to teachers, especially so that children of poor families may have a free instruction. Teachers must be members of the Reformed Church and must be well trained in catechism instruction, must subscribe to the Belgic Confession and the Heidelberg Catechism, and promise to diligently instruct their students in the fundamentals of Christianity according to the Catechism. They are to te teach their children two days a week to memorize and understand the rudiments of the catechism. For this purpose, three forms of catechism are to be used. The first, for the young children, shall contain the Apostles' Creed, the Decalogue, the Lord's Prayer, the institution of the sacraments, and of church discipline, along with simple questions and some important passages of scripture. The second form of catechism for more advanced children shall be a compendium of the Heidelberg Catechism. The third form for older youth shall be the whole Heidelberg Catechism. Teachers shall see to it that students memorize these forms of catechism and properly understand the doctrine by explaining it to, at, to them at their level whether they, uh, and, and examining whether they grasp the meaning. On Sundays, this is an interesting one, on Sundays the teachers should also take their students to the catechism services. Now to check on teachers, the minister should visit the schools regularly, they should admonish any teacher found negligent and if such teachers do not comply, the magistrate should replace them. Third, the duty of ministers in the church is to preach the catechism in such a manner that their services are brief and adapted to the level of the youth and the adults, and it would also be helpful to review these sermons. Next, adults, especially those who have had little or no schooling, they should be better instructed in the basics of the Christian religion since experience teaches that ordinary catechism services are not sufficient for many people. The minister and an, and an elder should gather together such adults as may desire to learn in a weekly meeting held in a home or in the kid's sister room to discuss with them the main points of the Christian religion at their level and review catechism sermons with them. For those who desire to join the church, there should be separate catechism instruction for three or four weeks before such people would desire to celebrate the Lord's Supper. After the decision on catechizing was read, the issue service, uh, surfaced about whether a scripture text should be read before the catechism sermon. The custom in most places was not to take a text of scripture, but a portion of the catechism 
as the text for the Catechism Sermon. Now the Remonstrants long complained that this elevated the Catechism above the Bible. In this discussion, the delegates of Gelderland proposed that it would be fit for ministers before their catechism sermons to read some text of scripture on which the doctrine of the catechism was grounded. To this, President Bogerman responded that the custom of reading only the text of the catechism was long established and could not be conveniently recalled. The committee of three theology professors and three ministers was appointed to drop drafts for the two proposed shorter catechisms, and they were instructed to stick as much as possible to the words of the Heidelberg Catechism. Now, moving on to one of the closing sessions of the Synod, this committee then presented its two shorter catechisms to the Synod for approval. But these two newly drafted catechisms were quietly set aside so as not to distract from the authority of the Heidelberg Catechism itself. For younger children, it was decided simply to use the ABC Bukia, which had been in use in the Dutch schools. And in place of the new mid-level catechism, the synod recommended the use of the Kort Begrip, a summary of the Heidelberg Catechism that had been drafted in 1608 by Hermanus Falkelius, who was now one of the Dort vice presidents. Moving on to the third topic, the remonstrant observations on the Heidelberg Catechism. For well over a decade, Arminius and the remonstrants had expressed concerns about the need to revise the Belgic Confession and Heidelberg Catechism without offering outright objections to these confessional standards, which might have put them into question in regard to their loyalty to the Reformed faith. Their opponents suspected that they were secretly harboring errors contradicting the confessions, which they refused to express openly. When the remonstrant leaders were summoned to appear before the Synod of Dort to have their views examined and adjudicated, their citation letters stated that they were summoned so that they might explain their views of the five articles of Arminianism, but also that they might present in writing to this synod all their observations, if they have any, concerning the doctrine contained in the Confession and Catechism. After the remonstrance appeared at the synod in early December, there were five weeks of procedural wrangling between them and the Synod about how to treat the issues in controversy. And this wrangling also included the remonstrant observations on the confessions. After the remonstrants submitted their brief statements of their views on the five articles, President Bogerman demanded that they submit their objections now to the confession and the catechism. The remonstrants expressed surprise that their observations should be required so soon, since their letters of citation seemed to indicate that the controversy on the five articles should be resolved first before proceeding to their observations on the confessions. Now, this occasioned a lot of acrimony until the secretary of the state delegates, Daniel Heinzius, pounded on the table and shouted that the state delegates commanded them to obey. After much debate, the state delegates gave them four days to submit their observations. And they were to do so individually, not jointly. Now the remonstrants promised that they would do their best to get ready. On the 21st of December, a rumor spread throughout Dordrecht that something extraordinary, long-kept secret, was about to break out at the Synod. For the first time, 
Five or six women also appeared as spectators. That session, the remonstrants submitted their observations on the Belgic Confession, signed by all of them. In their preface, the remonstrants declared that they called into doubt no doctrine that was approved by the common judgment of the Reformed Church. Their observations just related to phrases or order or manners of speaking. They were only presenting these observations for the purpose that they might be of service to the synod when it would begin a serious review or revision of the confession or catechism. Now the remonstrant document began with general observations on both the confession and catechism. These observations were all posed in question form with questions such as, is everything treated in proper order in these writings? Can such writings be rightly called secondary norms of faith? Does the catechism bear such authority that it is appropriate for pastors to read and explain it as the text for, pre for preaching, as if it were a scripture reading? Now, President Bogerman then asked the Synod's opinion on the fact that the Remonstrants had not submitted their observations on the Heidelberg Catechism and that they had presented their observations on the Belgic Confession jointly, not individually. Some thought that they should be given more time to drop their observations on the Catechism, but most thought that they had not complied with the orders of the Synod and deserved a reprimand. When the remonstrants were called in, Episcopius replied that they didn't have sufficient time to prepare their observations on the catechism. Well, finally, on the 27th of December, the remonstrants submitted their observations on the catechism. A larger document was, first of all, signed by seven of the remonstrants. Four others presented individual observations. Now, as with their earlier observations on the Belgian Confession, the remonstrant ob observations on the Heidelberg Catechism were also posed in question form, rather than in terms of direct assertion. This approach protected them from being accused of teaching errors that contradicted the confession and the catechism as confessional standards. Besides the general observations on the catechism, the remonstrants also offered particular observations on 74 of the catechism's 129 questions. Now, most often, these observations are rather superficial. Questions like, can't this be better stated? Is the order incorrect here? Is this answer incomplete? Does the scripture text appropriately support the answer? Some observations, however, suggest a more substantial critique of the catechism, though the remonstrants were careful not to deny that they, devi or, or, to deny that they deviated from the basic reform doctrine. Now here I'm only off, going to offer a sampling of their observations. In their observations on the catechism, the remonstrants first asked whether the catechism's manner of instruction is appropriate for instructing youth at their level, since it does not appear to be well adapted to the level of children and the uneducated. The individual remonstrants who submitted their observations also offered several general observations on the catechism. Frederica asked, shouldn't the catechism consist as much as possible of the very words of scripture? For catechism sermons, is it proper first to read from the catechism without reading a text of scripture? <laughs> 
Doesn't this honor belong only to the word of God? Since the common folk might regard the catechism as the word of God, shouldn't some measure be taken to present, prevent this error so that all may understand that the catechism is just a human writing? Goswinus asked, can it be properly said that the catechism is a little Bible by which all doctrines and sermons must be examined? Mathesius asked, isn't the catechism incomplete since it does not explicitly deal with the authority, perfection, perspicuity of scripture, nor the nature and attributes of God? Now, on the catechism's famous question one, the remonstrants ask several questions. Shouldn't the purpose of the catechism be extended, not just for consolation or comfort in life and in death, but also for the instruction in the truth and for doing good? And does the phrase, all things must work together for my salvation, does that phrase suggest that our sins do not hinder our salvation? Shouldn't these words somehow be restricted? Now, sometimes in their observations, the remonstrants use the catechism against their reformed opponents. For example, in question six, do the words that God created people in order to live with him in eternal blessedness, do those words refer to the whole human race? If so, does this agree with the Reformed theologians who teach that God created the majority of the human race for destruction? Also, sometimes in their observations, the remonstrants interpreted the catechism as a confirmation of their own theology of the five articles, or they suggested changes that would be more in line with their own theology. So, regarding question 20, whether all are saved through Christ as all are lost through Adam, shouldn't a distinction be expressed here between the obtaining of salvation, which pertains to the whole human race, and the application of salvation, which pertains only to believers? Moving on to question, uh, the fourth category. The Palatine response to those remonstrant observations. When the remonstrants submitted their observations on the Catechism on December 27, Abraham Scultatus spoke up on behalf of the Palatine delegation. The Palatine delegates wanted a copy of those remonstrant observations since these, since the catechism related to their own Heidelberg, uh, these observations related to their own Heidelberg catechism. And the Palatine elector had commanded their delegates to ensure that no changes be made in the catechism. So they wanted a copy to be able to examine it and respond to these observations. When done, they expected to send their response to Heidelberg for approval, and then finally present it to the Synod. The response by the Palatine theologians is 84 pages long in manuscript. It is likely that the Palatine response was prepared by Heinrich Alting, one of the Palatine delegates. Now again, I'll only give a sampling of the responses related to the remonstrant observations that I've already mentioned. So first, regarding the general observation that the catechism's appropriateness for youth um, was perhaps not appropriate, the Palatine response was that it was so prepared that youth may find the milk of Christianity in it and adults might find solid food. <laughs> 
Its manner of explanation is very appropriate, they said. As for using the very words of Scripture, well, the Catechism throughout, throughout uses words and phrases of Scripture. It's not necessary that it consist only of Scripture texts because it ought to declare briefly and popularly the chief points of religion that are based on the Bible. Certainly, or, or concerning the reading of a scripture text before a catechism sermon, the catechism is a brief explanation of the main points of religion drawn from scripture and approved by the church. Whether or not a sermon is prefaced by a text of scripture makes little difference. As for the catechism being a little Bible, for them, the little Bible was actually the five main documents of the Christian religion, the creed, the decalogue, the Lord's Prayer, the institution of the supper, and the institution of baptism. By these, all doctrines and sermons ought to be examined. The catechism is a brief explanation of these five documents, all drawn from scripture. Moving on to the particular remonstrant articles, uh, observations on uh, um, question one. The Palatine delegates asserted that the highest end of catechetical instruction is consolation in life and in death. But the subordinate ends or purposes are instruction in the truth and doing good. As to whether the phrase all things must work together for my salvation, whether that includes sin, they replied that these words, they're simply drawn from Romans 8, and they relate to the calamities and adversities of the Christian life. Those who see this as a license to sin never taste this lively consolation. On the remonstrant suggestion to add a the distinction between obtaining and applying salvation, in question 20, the Palatine theologians replied that this distinction was unnecessary and superfluous, since nowhere in scripture does it say Christ obtained salvation for the whole human race. Besides, the phrase obtaining salvation is rather ambiguous. Now, as it turned out, the Synod never did have the time specifically to consider the remonstrant observations on the Catechism, nor the response of the Palatine delegates. Other issues were simply too pressing. Number five, the examination and approval of the Heidelberg Catechism. After the Synod finished drafting the canons, the States General approved the actions of the Synod and then asked the Synod to review the doctrine of the Belgic Confession and Heidelberg Catechism for anything that was not consistent with Scripture. Hence, the Synod read the, Heidelberg, read the Belgic Confession and both the foreign and the Dutch delegates declared that it contained no doctrine inconsistent with scripture. Now the style and the articles on church order were really not for, up for discussion here. Then on the morning of May 1, the state delegates reported that the states general also wanted the catechism to be reviewed and examined, whether anything in the catechism was incons inconsistent with the word of God. So, in this session, Secretary Damanis publicly read all the questions and answers of the Catechism. Everyone was asked to declare their view of the, script, of the doctrine contained in the Catechism, not the method or the phraseology. That afternoon, the British theologians praised the Catechism saying that neither their churches nor the French churches had such an excellent catechism, saying that 
Uh, the men who drafted it were singularly moved by the Spirit of God. In various other matters, some theologians exceeded them, but in drafting this catechism, they had surpassed themselves. But on the, manner, the matter of Christ's descent into hell, the British defended the right of their own churches to interpret that differently although they admitted that the Heidelberg interpretation was according to the analogy of faith. The Bremen delegation had the same kind of re uh, reservation. The Palatine theologians then gave a short overview of the history of the catechism as prepared by Zacharias or Sinus and others. They also explained that the remonstrant observations got the remonstrants themselves into trouble with the catechism, since it appeared that the catechism was not in conflict with scripture. Now this discussion led then to the synod's decision. Quote, it was declared unanimously by all the foreign as well as Dutch theologians that the doctrine contained in the Palatine Catechism wholly agrees with the word of God, does not contain anything inconsistent with it which needs to be changed or corrected. Now since a major complaint of the remonstrant observations was that the catechism was not well suited to the level of youth, the synod also added, this catechism is a completely accurate compendium of orthodox Christian doctrine adapted with singular wisdom, not only to the level of tender youth, but also for the proper instruction of adults. Now later, the remonstrance complained that a review of such importance was conducted behind closed doors and was done very hurriedly with hardly four hours spent on deliberating about the catechism. He also complained that the synod did not even consider their remonstrant observations on the catechism in their review. Although in the post-acta sessions, the synod revised the text of the Belgic Confession, it did not do so with the Heidelberg Catechism since that was considered the prerogative of the Palatine churches in Heidelberg. So while the synod approved the doctrine of the catechism, it did not produce an official text of it. Hence, the most authentic Dutch text of the catechism is the one that had earlier been authorized by the Zeeland Provincial Synod the edition published in the 1611 Formulieren book printed in Middleburg. Now toward the end of the synod, in session 177, the synod decided to prepare a document requesting the States General to confirm the synod's action and follow up on some of them. One item requested was that the States General confirm and defend the doctrine presented in the Confession, Catechism, and Canons. Now attached to this was a uh, document, an act of approval of the Confession and Catechism that concluded with this request to the States General. Quote, the Synod very submissively, submissively asks and requests that their high mightinesses be pleased by their authority to maintain, propagate, confirm, protect this orthodox doctrine contained in the aforesaid confession and catechism in their lands and not tolerate that any violation or falsifying be done to this doctrine, nor that any other doctrine be taught or pursued in the public churches of their lands. Last point, five, the approval of forms of subscription. Early in the Dutch Reformation, ministers simply signed a copy 
of the Belgian Confession to affirm their agreement. In 1593, one sees the expectation that the Heidelberg Catechism be signed along with the Belgian Confession. Then as the Arminian controversy developed, both the Confession and Catechism became used as standards of orthodoxy. Now the Arminian perspective was that scripture alone is the rule of faith and the Confession should not be used as standards for doctrinal purity. Now, since some Arminians signed the Confessions according to their own sense of how, one, how they should be understood, a simple signing of a copy of a confession or a copy of the catechism was no guarantee of orthodoxy. Hence, a more precise means of determining orthodoxy was needed. In this context, forms of subscription became prevalent, prevalent in the Dutch churches. Beginning in 1608, classes Alkmaar developed a form of subscription whereby ministers agreed that both the confession and catechism agreed with the word of God. Soon such subscription, the forms of subscription developed in various synods, but there was no standard form. Now the Synod of Dort first considered forms of subscription in the post opta sessions after the Arminian issue was resolved. The Synod decided that a, to draft a new form of subscription requiring all ministers to subscribe not only to the Confession and Catechism, but also to the Canons to bear witness to their orthodox views. Now a committee was appointed to draft a new form of subscription for ministers. In this new form, ministers declared that, quote, all articles and points of doctrine contained in the Confession and Catechism of the Reformed Churches, together with the explanation of some points of the aforesaid doctrine, in other words, the canons, the canons made by this synod, do fully agree with the word of God. They also promised to diligently teach the doctrine and oppose all errors in conflict with it. If they had any objections to this doctrine, they promised not to teach them, but to reveal these to the church authorities and be willing to give a further explanation, if required, under the penalty of suspension from their office. A week later, separate forms of subscription was sim similar to the one for ministers, was approved for professors of theology, for rectors and school teachers. As for subscription by elders and deacons, the Synod of Dort left this up to the discre discretion of local classes and provincial synods. Conclusion. If I might summarize the relationship of the Synod to the Catechism in one sentence, it would be this. The Synod of Dort officially confirmed and strengthened the authority of the Heidelberg Catechism in its two primary roles within the Dutch Reformed Churches. First, as a confessional standard to ensure Orthodox Reformed teaching in the churches, and second, as the principal pedagogical tool to provide instruction in the fundamentals of the Reformed faith. Dort did not adopt the Catechism for the first time, nor did it change it or introduce a new role for it. The Synod confirmed the doctrine of the Catechism and strengthened it by standardizing roles and practices that were already in place in the churches. Catechetical, catechetical instruction in the home, school, and church, Sunday afternoon catechism services, pre-confession catechism classes, and the role of the catechism as a confessional standard by use of forms of subscription signed by ministers, teachers, and theologians. <laughs>